Awesome. It's been a couple weeks since I've been in here. Uh, I heard last week was awesome. Uh, Brad, who is our young uh, professionals pastor who is new, uh, was sharing with you guys. And so, man, it's just a great opportunity uh, for me to be back and kind of talk about some fun stuff tonight. I'm really excited. We're going to talk about murder. <laughs> as, I was, as I was going through, I'm like, what? You can't see my eyes? Is it because, is my hair that bad? Okay, come on, be honest. How about if I do this? Yeah. I'm going to take out my shirt too, so no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to wear my hat. I, I, it doesn't bother me. You have to look at me. I don't have to look at me, so uh, for the video, I apologize. Um, if you can't see my eyes, yeah, that's, that's not good. So thank you for saying that. So, yeah, I just got out of the pool, as you can tell. So, Anyway, <laughs> what am I talking about? All right, let me do this. Uh, because of what we're going to jump into tonight, I want to get us started with some prayer and um, it's interesting because what we're going to talk about, we're going to dig deep into some scriptures and kind of some Old Testament laws that are going to seem really maybe a little bit strange. And then we're going to kind of take those Old Testament laws and those scriptures and then we're going to kind of uh, say, how, what is God getting at and how does that apply to me today? So I want to ask in the beginning of my, of my message as we talk through those things, you know, really pay attention to what I'm saying, kind of walk through with me and Again, anytime you have questions uh, in here, just raise your hand. I love this environment. It's much easier than in the big room where I can just actually see your face and uh, if you raise your hand, um, and I'll try and answer any questions that you have. So um, I'm really excited. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Jesus, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come and learn in such a, in such a way where we can just open up and study and Lord, we know that uh, the, the Bible promises us um, that, that it transforms us. It, 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 when we leave this place, we should be different than when we walked in this place because of what your word says. And so even in going through subjects like we're talking about tonight, I pray and ask that that changes us from the inside out. That Lord, you change us from the inside out through your word. That we would be more like Jesus by the end of this talk. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So we've been uh, going through the, uh, the Ten Commandments. And let me tell you the context of what I'm gonna, how I'm going to approach this certain commandment and the ones that I've taught. I don't know if all the guys have done it that way, but this is just the way I approach it. Um, is I believe the Ten Commandments are a marriage contract to, to God's people. Uh, if you were here for the first one, we talked about that. It's this idea of a ketubah. It's a contract saying, hey, guys, um, if this marriage is going to work between God and, and his people, then these certain things must be true. And so those are the commandments which are saying, hey, if, if, again, if this relationship is going to work, and what's the first commandment? Have no other gods before me. Basically saying this, that if this relationship between God and his people is going to work, then you can't have other lovers. You, it's just you and me. You can't have other gods in your life. Uh, if this relationship is going to work, you have to understand that God's name can't be contained. You know, that's using, uh, uh, that's the idea of idols and different things. like that. God's name can't be contained and, and, and so forth. And so today or tonight, I'm going to talk about this idea of, of what does that mean for, for this commandment that we're going through. Because it's really interesting. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Exodus chapter 20 and look at verse 13. We're kind of going back. I know we'd already talked about some other ones, but, but we're kind of headed back. So this is the sixth commandment. It says this, um, you shall not murder. All right, so uh, I'm done. That's pretty much easy. All right, I'm out. <laughs> like, don't murder. Uh, does anybody have a different translation for that word murder in there? Kill? Okay. What kind of Bible do you have? Do you know? Whoever said that? New American Standard? Okay, does anybody else have a different translation? King James, so that would be kill too. Yeah, interesting. Well, in the old King James, kill was the same as murder. 
the actual translated word is murder. And so what we're going to talk about today is not killing, but murdering. Because there is a big difference between the two, biblically. So murder would be uh, premeditated, uh, out of anger. Murder would be something you were planning to do. Killing would be, there's a whole nother set of rules and laws and regulations on what killing is. So, so it's kind of hard sometimes to get that difference when it says do not, so, you know, you get a lot of non-Christians or, or people who don't believe in God and they say, well, see, the Bible's messed up because it says, you know, you should not murder and then all the, there's all these places where God's people kill and yes, there's a, there's a huge difference between the two and I'm not going to unpack that tonight. Um, I'm going to stick to what this says. And, and we can unpack that later some other time if you're interested in that. But that in itself is a, a three or four week study on uh, the difference between murder and killing. So we're going to keep it to this idea of murdering and how that's different. And, and let me kind of explain what that is. Turn over to Exodus 21, just a page over to the right, and look at verse 12. So we're going to look at some of these laws um, and look at what they say. It says this, in 21 verse 12, he says this, uh, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Okay? So you go around and you get in a bar fight, you know, you knock some guy out and he dies. Well, the price you pay is you get put to death, okay? This is how they dealt with things back then. 13, however, listen to this, this is important. If he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. Now, basically what that's saying is, if it was an accident, that's one thing. If it was intentional, that's another thing. You see the difference there? So if I go into a place and I see a guy, I say, man, I'm going to take that guy out. What's up? And, uh, sorry, that's my, never mind. Gosh, this is a horrible day. Um, <laughs> and then I look and I say, I'm going to take that guy out, right? And, and, and I plan it, and I organize it, and I get my buddies in on it. Boom, that's, that's way different than if I walk in, and all of a sudden I get in a fight, and I hit some guy in the wrong place, and, you know, collapse his nose or something, and he, and he dies. Okay, there's, there's a difference between the two. Listen as he goes on. So it says this. For, verse 14, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So again, premeditated murder. Verse 15, and he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. I have this up on a refrigerator at home. So I look at the kids and I go, do it. Just do it and watch what happens. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's kind of scary. Verse 16, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hands, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So again, you can use that on your kids today. Just quote that every time they disobey, disobey or uh, they say something bad about you. Um, verse 18, as it goes, it says this. If men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or his fist, and he does not die but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time, and he shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. Which I think is cool. I wish we did that these days, right? Where, um, where that would happen. If you hurt someone, that you're responsible. Your insurance company doesn't pay. You have to go in and pay. Um, and you have to take care of things. And you have to take care of the person you hurt. So again, these are the Jewish laws. These were the laws uh, because, remember, they're building a brand new nation. Now, what I think is so funny is you look at these. These, these are pretty specific so I'm sure that they happened, right? It's not like they're, they're just supposing these things happened. So we're really looking at a picture of the things that were going on during that time, okay? And so they were dealing with the same stuff we're dealing with. And, uh, and you have two different, like, do, if, how do we know if someone murdered someone? How do we know if someone killed someone? And what do we do with that? How does all that work? They were dealing with the same stuff that we're dealing with. Now scoot over to your right, to Numbers 35. We're going to go into a little bit deeper. Any questions on that, what we just talked about? Numbers 35. This gets a little more interesting. 
we're, we're, we're starting to see now, we're going to start seeing the heart of God, okay? You're going to start seeing kind of through the laws we understand and get to know who God is, okay? So in Numbers uh, 35, look at verse 9. It says this. Now remember, well, before I jump to that, remember the nation is being built, right? So this is all, everything's brand new. So they're setting it up to where, hey, we got to make sure we have everything in place so we do things right. And so that's why all this stuff is so important. So, so in verse 9 he says, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, right? When you get to the promised land, when you get to the place I promised, when you're there, verse 11, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. Okay? That, that uh, the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. So, so here's the picture. God says, this is what I want you to do. I know that killing is going to happen, meaning accidental killing is going to happen. We'll see that in just a minute. And when that accidental killing happens, what do you do with those people? Because, I mean, there's blood that was shed. They're responsible for that blood even though it was accidental. And so, so God set up three cities to be called cities of refuge, which I think is kind of cool. And, and it's interesting they use the word manslayer, right? So when you, when you kill someone, you're called like, the, I'm the manslayer. Um, imagine if they use those terms today. But anyway, it's just kind of interesting when you look at it. So it says, so, um, so you shall appoint the cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. So it's like this. Let's say uh, I'm in my backyard and I have an ax and I got, you know, when it, Earl's coming over and uh, Earl and I are chopping wood uh, out in the 110 degree heat. And, I, and when, I, when, I'm, when I'm throwing my ax, all of a sudden the head of the ax comes off and hits Earl right in the chest and he falls over and dies. Sorry, bud. Um, <laughs> no, no, I didn't mean to kill him. I didn't mean to kill him, but I'm still responsible for his death. And so it says, what was that? Off I go. I, I go and I run to um, I go and run to one of these cities of refuge. Now Earl's family, then all of a sudden they get I'm in trouble because they're going to have someone from their family who's supposed to avenge his blood. So their responsibility is to come and kill me. So I have to get to the city of refuge before they come kill me, which and, and I, <laughs> I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> Okay, so here, let, let's go on, and it'll spin a little further. And it says this, um, verse 14, You shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan, and three cities you shall appoint to the land of Canaan, uh, which will be cities of res- refuge. These six cities shall be refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a neat thing. But... Verse 16, but if he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer. And the murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he strikes him with a stone in the hand by which one could die and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon by which one could die, you know, he's, this is a law. They're, this is kind of law, so they're describing all the instances. Or if he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon, uh, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And then look at verse 19. So the avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. And so someone in the family, someone they call him the near of kin, would be responsible to go avenge blood. I mean, it's a crazy world. Can you imagine that? Like you're actually out killing it. And then whoever you killed, their brother or sister, whoever's coming after you to kill. I'm going to make a movie about this because it would be pretty awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yep, an eye for an eye. You took part of our family and we're going we're gonna to take you out. So then I, I'm actually, well, it stops at the Avenger. The Avenger of blood has legal authority to do that. So, and even now in some uh, Middle Eastern countries, I mean, they don't mess up. You don't wait in the court. I mean, this just happens. It's like you're done. If you steal... Uh, my mom used to live in Yemen. We were just talking about this the other day. She was here in town. Uh, if you were in town and you stole, they would just, once they saw you steal, it's not like they would wait. All of a sudden, uh, the guy who owns the, the fruit that you just stole would get his sword, chase after you, and chop off your hand. That's how you do it. Take care of business. You don't, you, 
That's how it was. So it was the same, kind of the same idea, and it still happens today in some places in the world. Um, so the avenger of blood then himself shall put the murderer to death. Verse 20. If he pushes him out of hatred, listen to this, this is interesting. If, uh, if he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait, hurls something at him so that he dies, or in enmity, he strikes him with his hand so that he dies, then the one who strikes him surely shall be put to death. He is a murderer. Again, the avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death. So it's about anybody lying in wait, anybody preparing, anybody, uh, this premeditated uh, killing that happens, which is called murder. Now, look at verse 22. So then it says this, however, again, I know, guys, you're like, why are we learning about this? I hope they don't make sense. However, if he pushes him suddenly without enmity, enmity, excuse my pronunciation, or throws anything out at him without lying in wait, or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing it at him without seeing him, so that he dies, while he was not his enemy or seeking his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. You see what happens? It's a totally different picture, um, killing and murdering. And so what he's saying is, let's say, you know, again, we're out in the backyard and I'm, we're just throwing rocks. And I, boom, hit somebody in the head. They die. I didn't mean to do that. The avenger of blood of that family comes and I go. We go to, I go to the city of refuge hopefully before that guy gets me, and, uh, and that the council decides if I'm guilty or not, okay? And if I'm guilty, then I'm done. Um, but if I'm not, then, then listen to what happens. It gets even more interesting. You'll see why I'm saying this. Verse 25, so the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there. Now listen to this, it's really interesting. He shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Okay? Now, now seeing that, so, 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 so you see what happens. So, so when, even though I'm not guilty of, of the, you know, the sin or whatever, or I'm guilty of the sin, but I, I'm not going to pay the consequences, there, I still have to go live in the city of refuge. And, and when am I allowed to leave the city of refuge? There's only one time. What was that? Yeah, when the high priest dies. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So I have to wait till the high priest dies in order for me to be free. Now, just picture this for a minute. I'm just picturing this back then in that day and time. Imagine if you're that high priest and you have all these murderers and killers, right? And they don't get to go home till you're dead, right? What's that world like? Like, he's always probably looking around and... Because they can't go, they, they're stuck there. They can't leave until he's dead. And this poor high priest, you know, is like, oh, crud, looking all around his back, you know, because who knows how many people would come into that town in that city of refuge, and he has to give them refuge and protect them and watch over them and make sure they're taken care of. Um, but they can't leave until he dies. Now, what does that remind you of? Just picture that. Who's, who is our high priest? Yeah, Jesus. So what is that saying? What, what, is, what do you see the picture there? Because it's really interesting. If you really grasp onto that picture. Yeah, your sins are right at the death of the high priest, you're set free. Isn't that crazy? So there's this, this, this kind of type of you know, forgiveness in Jesus and kind of the personality of God right in the midst of these scriptures. And so you have this, this picture of this high priest, and once that high priest dies, that the sins of, of that person are really absolved and they can go and live free. Such as when Jesus died for you and I, oh, we can go and live free. We are no longer held by the bonds of our past. We're no longer held by the, the things that we've committed, you know. And so it's this, again, this, this picture of, of, of who God is. Uh, verse 26. Let's go on because it gets kind of interesting. It says this, so, but if the, if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of the blood. So you're stuck in that. You are literally stuck in the city. And if you leave the city, the, the avenger of blood has every right to come after you and kill you if you leave. Isn't that interesting? So you're not under the protection of the high priest anymore. 
uh, and the city itself. Uh, verse 28, uh, because he should have remained in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, uh, the manslayer may return to the land of his possessing, uh, his possession. So he, he can go back home after, after the death of the high priest. Okay, interesting stuff. Any, any questions on that? Any, yes. Yeah, this one, yeah. And I'm giving you a picture of the laws right now. We're going to kind of bring it back. So when, when, when I say do not murder, you can understand the difference between killing and murder, right? And, and because there's a big difference, murderers were put to death immediately, uh, and, and that's a much stricter judgment than, than people who killed, okay? And again, killing has, there's so much more involved, not just this, but, you know, when you go to war, can you kill? When you, you someone comes into your house, uh, you know, can you protect your family? Can you kill them? All those things, which I would say absolutely. The Bible's very clear. That is fine. Some people disagree, and there may be some people in this room that are passive. They say, oh, no, no, no. You, you know, I had a friend who said, uh, you know, if, if somebody came into my home and was, you know, murdering my children and my family, I would have to sit back and let it happen because God said, you know, I shall not kill. And, I, and I'm like, you know, for me, I'm like, no, I totally disagree. I think the word of God's pretty clear. So, so yeah, that. But I, I'm not kind of I'm not headed there tonight. I'm kind of trying to to show you the the big picture between murder and killing, and then we're going to talk a lot about murder right now. So, does that answer your question? This, if the city is a refuge applied to the people that murdered, no, no. The city of refuge only applied if it was an accident, and then they had to go to a trial. And if the trial uh, between the council, uh, the guy who, the manslayer and the avenger of blood, and if they discovered that it was an accident, then that person would have to move to, um, to the city of refuge until the high priest died. And then he would be able to return home. Yes. What if in the city of refuge, somebody had another accident? <laughs> An accident, then we call that like a serial killer or, <laughs> wait, that guy got hit in the head with a rock again? <laughs> okay, well, well, explain what you mean by that. Yeah, I am not a professional on Jewish law, but I, this is what I would probably assume, and I may be totally wrong on this, that they would have to go to another city of refuge. And then once they were done with that, then God would probably just strike them dead. So, but, but again, I don't know. <laughs> They're pretty slick if they can get through that many. But that's a good question. That's a good question. Yes. Oh, that's a great question. So the question was, who assigns the avenger? So the avenger of blood, uh, it would be next of kin, so it would be the brother, first the brother or the father or somebody close, and then that would go down to cousin, you know, so it would be the immediate close family. Yeah. So that's from what I know, from what I've read. Um, you know, or they pay some, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, they show him, uh, you be the avenger of blood, we'll pay you. <laughs> I will kill you. <laughs> I am the avenger of blood. So, good, good. Yes, question, good. No, <laughs> it's a constant cat and mouse, like, <laughs> so is the Avenger back in play. No, at that point, uh, the, the manslayer is totally 100% forgiven. So, and again, these are real people at real times. Okay, imagine the drama that that creates in a city. Right? Because these are tight-knit communities. So just, just think of, oh, I hate that person. Like, that's the guy that killed our Uncle Bob or whatever. And, oh, my gosh, and I can't believe they got away with I mean, you can imagine how crazy all of that got. There was drama back in the Old Testament. Crazy stuff. Yes. If, if the event, if, the question was, if the avenger is coming after you, just lay down and kind of submission position and you know ki get killed. You know, that's I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I will have to study. I don't know. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. 
But like I said, this would be a great movie, I think. The Avenger of Blood. So could, any other questions before we move on? Good questions, guys. Great questions. All right. Uh, go ahead and um, scoot back to Exodus. Well, actually, what time? No, I won't have enough time. All right, I can't go there. I talk too much. Um, so, so let me, let's take it in a different direction. So we know that the Bible says, when it says, uh, it doesn't say do not kill, it says do not murder. So then my next question then to ask and kind of bring it to us is, so when and why does one murder? Like when, I mean, how do you get to that place? And we see murder everywhere today, right? And sometimes you see it and go, man, that's, like, how did that happen? You know, you hear people who have murdered other people and their family members going, I didn't see that coming, right? Or you think, how in the world could someone take another life? Like, how could that happen? Um, and so, so what brought them to that point? And so I'm going to kind of walk through a process with you, and I call it kind of the process of murder, which just sounds horrible. Um, and so I'm going to start, and I'm going to kind of use the ladder as an illustration. And so I'm going to do step one, and this is what I believe. Uh, and I may be wrong, but this is kind of how I picture it, is I think all and most, because we know that most murder happens by people you know. I mean, there is a lot of, there is some murder that happens just here and there by, by criminals and different things, but, but the vast majority happens by close relatives uh, and, and, and people that you know, you know, so make sure you keep one eye open at night. No, I'm just kidding. So, so how, I mean, how does that even begin? And even, yeah, even racially, we're seeing a lot of this stuff happen. We're seeing a lot of people who have hate crimes against certain uh, types of people. And, I mean, how does all that happen? Okay, so, so here I kind of put this list together. Is, is Number one is I think maybe they said, hey, they wronged me, right? This is kind of the first thing. So, so when you start here, you believe at some point that somewhere down the road someone wronged you. Maybe it's a person or a group of people or a type of person or someone at your work or your boss. You know, he didn't give you the raise. Somebody else got the raise. And, you know, we see this all the time. The employees go back and murder all the people, right, in their, in their workplace because they, they lost their jobs. Somewhere down the line it started, it birthed, the colonel thought was, man, somebody wronged me or this person wronged me, Okay. Um, the next step, I think, is what I would call uh, anger or, or, or bitterness, right? So then what happens is when you're wronged, what happens when, when you don't let go of that? It's just like bruising you. It's like a nasty, like you're boiling, like junk. And so if you feel like you're wronged, have you ever felt wrong? Just say, somebody raise your hand. If you ever felt wrong, okay. All of you, have, you're a bunch of liars. You're all, <laughs> weren't you here for do not lie? <laughs> but we've all felt wronged in one place or another. And if, and, and if you can't get out of that feeling of, of somebody did something bad to you and forgiveness, your next step is naturally anger and bitterness. And that anger is, you know, in the Bible, it's interesting, it's, it's kind of described as a boiling or red hotness. They call it hot anger or hot anger, or hot, you know, it, it's, an, it's just an interesting word. Why? Because we know, we know when, when somebody's wronged us or somebody's done something against us that we don't like. You know what? We have every right to be angry. Um, the next step, the, and again, these are just my opinion, is um, I, oh wait, I need a new piece of tape. I don't like them at all. Not just don't like them, but I don't like them at all. I don't like that person at all, or that group of people, or what they did to me, or my boss. Or I, I, not only did they wrong me, not only am I, am I anger and bitter, but you know what? I just I just don't like them. Now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you ever felt that way? There was somebody in your life that did something. Oh, and you did raise your hand. You're all confessing. So cool. You're all forgiven. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't, I, don't like, I don't like that person. You know, I'm, I, there's something about them, and uh, I want them out of my life, which brings me to the next one. 
is maybe, um, maybe you would say this, I will never like them or I will never forgive them. We made a conscious choice in our lives to say, you know what, they, they wronged me so bad, I'm so angry and bitter at them, I don't even like him, and you know what, at this point, at this point, I will never forgive them. I will never like them again. Somebody I'm really close to is dealing with this right now. She's an older lady, and she was really hurt when she was a child, and um, she's come to Christ, and she knows Jesus, and she's following him, but there's someone in her life she will not forgive. And I looked, and I told her, I said, you've got to forgive that person. Well, you don't know what they did to me. I don't. I don't know what they did. I don't know how bad it is. I don't know. But I know this is killing you more than it's killing them. Because we get to a point where, and it's not only that we don't like them, but, but man, there's no chance that we're never going to forgive them. Which brings us to our next step. I wish they would go away. Maybe is that familiar? Man, I'm gonna, I, you know what? I'm not going to forgive them. Not only am I not going to forgive them, but I don't even want to see them anymore. And this is where in your life you, uh, maybe, maybe if you're close to that person or it, in, in the sense of the area, if they were to go into a store and you saw them, you'd turn away and go to another store. Or you saw them driving on the street and you would ignore them. Or if you had a family function and it's a family member, you wouldn't show up because you just want them to go away. And your whole life is surrounded around this bitterness and this anger because of this forgiveness and you don't like them. And, and inside, there's this boiling that's going on. This change of heart that's happening, right? The next step is this. And this one's really sad and terrible. I hope bad things happen to them. So not only do you wish they would go away, but then you hear that one of their kids got in trouble with the cops or something, and you're like, yes, <laughs> they deserve it. They get in a car accident, and you're like, oh, I should feel sorry for them, but actually I'm really glad. So there's this progression. You kind of see how that works. You get this little bit of, they wronged me down here. You got some anger and bitterness, and all of a sudden you start stepping up. And it starts getting worse and worse. And then we come. It says this. My life would be better without them. And then we're taking it personal and we're saying, you know what? Actually, hmm. You know, if they were gone from the face of the earth, that might be a really good thing. <laughs> It's sad, but true, right? My life might be better. My life might be better without them even existing on this earth. Well, which is, brings me to the next one. I got to climb up the ladder, so if I fall, Frankie, will you take over for me? Yeah. <laughs> it says, this world would be better without them. If you look here, you can see the progression of how people think when they're ready to end someone's life. Because nobody, right, nobody sets out and says, oh, I'm going to kill someone, I'm going to murder someone, I'm going to take someone's life. You know, it starts here, and they take these steps, and all of a sudden they start justifying their feelings, and then they start convincing themselves. You know, it's interesting, the rabbis used to say, um, that without love, we would all be murderers. Without love, we would, because it's our natural instinct to go to a place of hatred for people that have hurt us. And so this world would be better without them. Uh, this world would be a better place if, if so-and-so wasn't here. This world would be a better place if these people weren't around anymore. This world would just be a better place. And then you come to the next one, which is, I don't even think they deserve to exist. I don't think they deserve to exist. And then the last one, which is, 
guess which one is that? Anybody? Maybe I will do everyone a favor and end this. Maybe I'll do myself a favor and end this. And then I have re- murder. I put red rum too because you see that movie. Kind of scary. So we, we see this gradual slope. We see this gradual slope of, of how it happened. And I think all of us would say, you know, maybe, maybe I've been here. Maybe some of you have been up here. And if any of you have been there, run. We got, all got to run because we're in trouble. But maybe you have in your thought life. Maybe, I don't know. But I would say most of us, if we struggle with relationship and people, we're right in here. I think that's quite interesting. I think that's quite interesting. So, so, so we look and we see that how does someone come to that place where they make that decision to take someone else's life? And, and, and again, you can agree with any of those. You can add any you want. But that's just kind of how I walked through kind of the thought process. So Michelle and I were, were driving too slow here in Arizona. And you don't want to drive too slow in Arizona. Um, people are crazy. You're crazy. I'm crazy now because I'm Arizona. Um, and I remember this guy was behind us. Michelle's like, this guy's on our tail. I'm like, okay. So I'm looking back. And, I mean, he's like, vroom, vroom, you know, trying to get by us. And so Michelle's trying to get out of the way. But, you know, when she changes lanes, he changes at the same time. And is like, are you trying to cut me? You know. And so we're just trying to let him pass, but he's so eager to get by. And then once he gets by, I mean, he flies by, rolls down his window, and, and I roll down mine. I'm like, hey, how you doing, man? I just apologize. And he's like, you, boom, I'm on it. And he's like, flip double birds, and he's going to town. And, I, and he had a cornerstone sticker on his back window. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but, he, but he, here, here's the thing. There was something in that moment where I looked at Michelle and I looked at this guy, I mean, this beet red faced, angry person, yelling and screaming, flipping us off. And I was violating. Like, like, it wasn't just somebody flipping you off and somebody angry with you, right? There was, there was, there was much more to it than just that. And if you say it doesn't affect you, that's great, but, but I think. I think at the core, there's so much more going on in that picture than just someone angry. What brought them, what is going on in that guy's life that me driving or Michelle driving that slow and doing that would bring them to this place? And I bet you if he would have been packing a gun, he probably would have been all the way up there. I'm going to do this world a favor because people like you shouldn't be driving anymore. You know, I don't know. But you can see how easy that ladder is to climb. And it kills us on the inside. It's kind of crazy. So, so how many people do you see have this thing brewing inside? Have this thing, just this anger that sets them off. <laughs> you know, when your kids disobey, sometimes that, that sets me off. You know, they do something that they weren't supposed to do. Or at work, somebody, you know, blows the, you know, the sale you were supposed to have. Or... Excuse me, somebody has 12 items in the 10-item lane at the grocery store, right? I mean, I've seen that. I've walked up and seen people get so mad. Look at that guy up there. Oh, my gosh, he's got like 13 things. The sign says 10, right? And, and they're angry and, and just like, what? what kind of people are we? Where there's this anger and bitterness and this brewing just at the surface, but something, uh, you know, somebody looks at you the wrong way. Yeah. When somebody throws something at you. Somebody doesn't want you teaching anymore. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so murder can often, often begin with contempt. Right? It, it, it often begins with this idea. And, and the word contempt is really interesting. You know, when you're contempt of court, do you know what that means? So... We, it's, 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 it's more than a disrespect. 
it's this idea that, that you're worthless and there's no consideration for the judge and, and, and in that courtroom or whatever. But even contentness is all around. And content means shoving something to the edges, okay? And so as people, when we get angry or bitter, we, what do we do? We begin to shove people to the edges, move them out of our lives, push them away from us. Because we, we, you know what, I, 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 I wish they would go away. You know, you see this, and I don't know if many, many of you maybe have been a, on the other end of this or on the, the bad end of this where maybe two people at work are making fun of this other person. I mean, content is all around us. Or a group of people, you ever walk into a room and a group of people's talking and they stop and look over at you and kind of laugh. And then you walk up and they all scatter. You ever feel that way? That content, that, that's real. That, there's, that is, that is, there's something wrong there. Does that make sense? And so you have this, this content that's all right. There used to be this website called uglypeople.com. Do not type it in now. This was, I typed it in today. That was very bad. Very bad. Do not type in uglypeople.com. But I'm sharing it with you because it used to be a website where people would upload photos of their friends who were, or not friends, but people they knew who were ugly, and the whole world would judge who was the ugliest. Well, that's all fun and games until your picture's on it. Like, man, that's just hilarious. Wait a minute, that's me. Oh, crud, I'm on the top of the list. Right? It's all fun. Oh, look at that ugly guy. Look at, oh, wait, oh, wait, I'm a part of it. That's contempt. That's the world we live in. There's constant brewing and anger and things going below the surface. We're in and there's somebody we have all these jokes about and, and making fun of that person brings us all together. Making fun of that group of people brings us all together. The only thing we have in common is that we hate something and somebody else. I used to work in a job where we weren't good employees. And really, truly, the thing that brought us together is that we all disliked the leadership of that workplace. You know what's funny is once that job ended for all of us, we didn't know what to talk about anymore. Because all we could talk about was all the bad negative stuff that we didn't like, and that's what brought us together. At the core, that's anger. At the core, that's, that's terrible. And yet, it's normal for us. It's normal in our world. It, it's that. So humor is often rooted in contempt. If you're passive aggressive in this room, you know this, right? And, and your anger doesn't come up front. It comes behind or in, you, you'll say something, kind of slide it in there. Did he just say that? Did she just say that? And you rip on people kind of behind their back or when things are quiet instead of really approaching and having a, an honest conversation. I'm just saying this because I used to be extremely passive-aggressive. And I understand that. And I was too afraid, so my passive-aggressiveness just turned to anger. Have you ever been given the silent treatment? The cold shoulder? Is any, have you ever, you know, maybe you have a friend or a family member or someone at work or a neighbor um, who you don't get a and, and that is... That is like saying you're dead to me, right? If someone walks and you are, you, you know, they look at everybody but you, that's terrible. That's horrible. And so we ignore them. This world would be a better place if you weren't here. I'm going to treat you, if you like, you're, like you don't exist. You are dead to me. This church would be a better place if they weren't here at this church. I've even heard people say that. Not here at this church, praise God. But I've heard people say about other churches. What is interesting is I know none of us in this room would say, I'm a murderer. I, and maybe you are, because I don't know every single person in this room. But maybe, And I'm sorry if I said that. I love you. Please don't hurt me. Um, but I, I would believe that most of us say, I am... I'm not a murderer. I am not someone who did. But, but how many of us get way up this ladder or to this point? 
maybe I would do everyone a favor or do myself a favor and end this. And they don't deserve to exist. And this world would be a better place if they weren't here. And we look at that ladder and we say, man, I'd probably never go to the top. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 with me. And look at this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. It says this. It says, Jesus is talking. And he's saying, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Now, now let me stop here. It's a, what Jesus is saying here is, is revolutionary for them to hear. Like for us to hear this, we're like, oh, okay, big deal. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, you have heard what, you've heard what the Bible says or what you've been taught the Bible says about murder. So he's given his, Jesus is a rabbi, he's given his rabbinical spin on what the Word of God says, the Old Testament right now. He's, he's, he's preparing them for something. He's saying, you've heard that it was said, just don't murder, right? You shall not murder. You've heard that the bats where it all started, just you shall not murder. And then listen to what he says, and he says, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Verse 22, and then he says this, he says, but I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, which means basically airhead, <laughs> idiot, right, shall be in danger of the council. And then he says, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So he's telling these people, saying, hey, you all thought it was the top of the ladder, murder that I was going after. You thought that's what God was going after. Just don't murder people. That's what you've been told. But what you don't understand, because Jesus came to fulfill the law, explain the law, and be the law. He didn't come to change the law. He basically is saying, this is what God meant, and this is how God wants you to live. So he basically takes this whole ladder, and he tips it, And he says, they're all the same. You murder someone, you're angry and bitter at someone, it's all the same in my eyes. Why? Because he knows, this is crazy and true, because God knows that if it's in our heart, it's just as real. It's just as real. See, we're masters of hiding it. They were masters of hiding it all. I could walk into a room and, oh, I love everybody, I'm great. But you don't know what I'm thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. Ah, oh, Bill Guy's an idiot. <laughs> we're masters of hiding it. And Jesus basically levels the playing field and says, oh, yeah, I believe you haven't murdered, but have you called someone stupid? Because that's just the same as murdering them in your heart. Have you called someone idiot? Right? Have you done these things? Because if you have, then according to God, you have broken the law the same as if you murdered. Wow. Well, I think even deeper, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, yeah. The, the question was uh, that there's no, how did you word that again? Let me make sure. Distinction of sin. Yep. Yeah. And so, so Jesus levels the law. Remember when he said, um, um, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Oh, yeah, we've heard that. Never committed adultery ever. Oh, but just a reminder, if you've ever looked upon a woman and lusted, you've committed adultery in your heart. Uh-oh. <laughs> What did it do? It just leveled the playing field. Level, it, it reveals who, who we are and our hearts. And when, when, when our hearts are revealed, you know what that does? That puts us in a place of needing a Savior. 
Because you know what, to be honest, if it's just not murder, I'm pretty good. Because I've never really went out and killed someone. However, if it's about being angry and bitter and thinking the world's wronged me and I don't like these people, I'm in big trouble. And when I stand before God and he says, hey, Bill, um, let's just look at number six. (laughs) And I go, oh. And then I fall on my knees and cry and we even say, please don't send me to hell because I deserve it. And that's just one. And the list goes on. The law wasn't put there to to help us do right and wrong. The law was there as a school teacher to show us that we need a savior. Oh my gosh. And so Jesus lays it out and he says, hey guys, you know what? You murdered? Well, there is no ladder. Whether you actually do it with your hands, do it with your heart, you've done it. You're just as guilty. And I think this is the brilliance of Jesus' teaching. And it's so real. Like if I came up to you and, 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 and I, or, or let me see, how, anybody married, recently married in here? Anybody recently married? Okay, you guys are recently, oh, you can raise your hand, that's all right. You know, when you started dating, right, there's this place when you find out that that other person likes you, Right? You find out, right, you're, you're in this dating relationship, or maybe you're not even in a dating relationship. Maybe it's even before you see each other, or you see each other across the room. And then their friend comes over and says, hey, hey, that girl over there thinks you're so cute. Now, now here's the weird thing. If that's true, right, it does something to us. It's efficacious. It's, it's effective. It changes who we are because we believe something, even though no flowers have been exchanged, no phone numbers, no, and we look over and the girl's like, hey, or what, and I don't know, I'm using bad illustration, but hopefully you'll, you'll get it with me. But, but, but you see, there's, there's this moment where you go, oh my gosh, that person believes something about me, and because they do, it changes who I am. Now, now think about this. That person hates you. What if that, what if someone came, I hate your, I, I hate your kind. And to, for us, it sticks and stones, may break my bones, names, that is not true. It, do, it's, it changes us. It's efficacious. It, it's effective and it's moving. And I, and I, and I hope I can, I, I can explain this. It, it can either make our day or ruin our life. And nothing was ever said or done. The professor thinks your work is pathetic on all the work you've done. I remember my school teachers telling me I'd never be anything and I would even graduate high school. That affects me to today. I still think, I still think I'm that kid because our words matter. That person doesn't like you because he thinks you're annoying. How do you react? The the words matter. Why? Why? Because if it's in the heart or the brain, it's somehow real. It's somehow real to you and I. And, and again, this is the branch that Jesus is teaching. So, so he says everybody is capable of murder given the right circumstance. Let's skip back to this verse. I'm going to end with this. So listen as he goes on. Listen to what he says. Verse tw- well, I'm going to go back to 22. So let's go through this again. It says this, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Remember, he's raising the bar. He's leveling the playing field. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, airhead, it, it, it's like this idea of, um, it's a terrible word, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And then he says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... Now stop there. This was a normal, we don't do this today. I, it just doesn't happen. But uh, as, as a Jew, you would go to uh, the altar and offer your gift, whatever it was for. And it was the most important thing you would do, whether during the week or the month or even the year, depending upon the circumstance and the festival. It was the mo- it w- it, there was nothing more important than to go and worship God by giving your gift at the altar. And, and he says this, it's a hyperbole. And Jesus says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. To them, they'd be like, are you crazy? Wait, leave worship to go and reconcile? Jesus, who are you? You're nuts. 
Like worshiping you is more, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing the point because you can't worship me if you have anger, bitterness in your heart. Why? Because there's no place for me when all that's in there. And you don't understand who I am. You don't understand who I am. You don't understand who God is. And then he says this, and he says, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It's like God is saying, if, if this relationship thing is going to work between you and I, you have to love people the way I love people. And if you can't, then it's not going to work. This thing isn't going to work. Because you have to choose to love people the way I love people. And how I love people is I forgive them. Is it easy? No. But that's how I roll. That's how God rolls. You have to love people the way I love people, and I'm not like you. So when you realize, this is, this is, and this is where it gets you, when you realize that God loves people the way that he loves you, Wait a minute. God forgave me. That means God forgives others. Wait a minute. That means I'm supposed to forgive others. That, wait a minute. That means I don't hold. Wait a minute. Now, again, we can get into a whole bunch of things. If you're in a wrong relationship or someone's abusing you, that's totally different. I'm not saying. But what I'm saying is we don't hold grudges. We don't hold bitterness. We don't hold anger. We, we deal with things emotionally healthy. And this is so important that it would take away from the most important thing in your life. So get right with them. Get right with the people in your life. Get right with the family member. Get right with the neighbor as much as you can, and they may not respond. They may, it's not up to you to get a response. It's up to you to get right. And it's up to you to forgive. Again, it's not easy. It's not just dropping it. It's not just, let, it's working through it. It's understanding that God's forgiveness is everywhere. Maybe it's a type of people. A people Get right. Whatever that is. And so that's my challenge for you is maybe even tonight you need to make that phone call when you go home. Maybe this week at work there's that person you need to talk to. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for this group, and, and I want to pray that if there is something keeping them from truly experiencing you, that, Lord, you would begin to reveal those things in their heart and their life. Father, that you, you would bring them, just bring them to their minds this week. That they would be the type of people, Lord, we would be the type of people, Lord, that would not live in anger and bitterness, but, Lord, we would we would live like you would in forgiveness and understanding. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great, we will see you next week.